delight in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has told me in garments of My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me in garments of salvation, and arrayed me in a robe, and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. delight in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me in garments of salvation, of We tried to convince the ladies to stay with us. They declined. I tried to remind them of how wonderful it is to sit in the front of a congregation like this and have everyone's eyes on you. That did not seem to convince them. <laughs> I hope you do, in fact, have the uh, brochure from Breath of Life. I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. Um, I'm going to assume that most students here are not wealthy. <clears throat> is, that, is that a safe assumption? <laughs> so I did not come here with the uh, realistic hope that the $1.6 million that we need for our dream will come from one student or another. So when you finish looking at it, ask the Lord where you ought to drop it somewhere and see if you can leave it around a wealthy neighborhood and let the Lord move on somebody's heart. <laughs> I have the feeling that, uh, that those who are uh, educators on this campus would also fall outside of the parameters of those from whom we should seek this 1.6 million. So uh, we're going to hope that the Lord will move. You need to pray for this ministry. For 24 years, Breath of Life, with a budget that is practically flat. If you looked at it beginning, it is almost about what it was now. Uh, this ministry has, because of the wonderful management skills of Walter Ortiz and the outstanding preaching of Charles Brooks, has gone on despite the paucity of funds. Now we are seeking to go to another plateau. Um, I know that I am not one to uh, try and walk in the shoes of C.D. Brooks. We have decided to bronze them. 
so that no one will be tempted to step into them. But um, in order to come into this marketplace with all of the challenges that are before us, there are funds that are required and we are praying about it. As I stand before you, there is a meeting that is in progress. It started perhaps today and will continue this week with some very wealthy people who are making a decision that might indeed benefit us to the extent that we can go on one network without having to pay at all. I believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and that the silver and the gold belongs to him. So I am not embarrassed to ask for it, for after all it belongs to God. Pray with us to that end. Now uh, let me read one verse. I believe that one verse in John chapter 10 will summarize what we hope to uh, have your thoughts directed towards. I was impressed at first with how many people had come until I realized that you are required to be here. <laughs> so you have burst my bubble now. <laughs> I think I remember those ubiquitous sheets, those cards that must be filled out. They are the little foxes that spoil the vine. <laughs> I intend to. <laughs> uh, here is what the Bible says in verse 41. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, we are come together tonight understanding that human power is not sufficient. What we need and what we desire is something that only God can give through his Holy Spirit. But we believe that the Spirit can walk in this place, can move in our hearts, can do for us individually and corporately things that are beyond our imagination to ask or to imagine. And so, with faith we proceed. All that I have and all that I am, I place into thy hands. It is not enough but a God who could cause so many to be fed with a little boy's lunch can certainly take what little there is to offer and make much of it. Do that, Father, and our soul shall be satisfied. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. John did no miracle. I tried as best I could to go to the original language and conjure up a scenario that would have the language suggest another kind of miracle. Because that is my personal belief, but often preachers are guilty of that level of eisegesis, making the Bible say what we must have it say. And so I confess to you tonight that it does not say that. What the people declared as Jesus came into this region of the country where John's preachments were still alive, what the people declared as Jesus moved among them, what the people had burning in their hearts even after the preacher was dead. And there, my friends, is the hope that we must cling to as those who would take forward the gospel that after we are gone, should the Holy Spirit speak through us, our words, because they were not ours after all, shall live on. The Bible says, quoting the people, 
He did no miracle, but all the things that he said of this man were true. To say that of a preacher today would be in and of itself a miracle. For there are people standing in pulpits who have glossed over truth, who will do anything to accomplish their ends. But I suggest that there must be some honesty in the pulpit. There must be some credibility here. For this is not an exercise in superfluity. This is not trying to aggrandize hearts and minds. This is to lift the name of Jesus. It does not need any extraordinary additions put to it. In fact, God would not have us add to it or subtract from it. Just declare it as it is. So what we declare here is that the people knew that there was power in the preaching of John. This prophet who Christ says was one so high as a prophet in his office that there was none greater. Yet this man did no miracle. No miracle in the ordinary sense. Now, some of us recognize that if you would draw a crowd, uh, the best way to a crowd is often not words. When I was a youth director, I, I developed Pearson's hierarchy of crowd development. It is amazing that the preacher did not come first on the list. First was food. If you would draw a crowd, feed people. I can tell you now that if you have the wherewithal within your reach, if you invite people to your home and simply feed them, the food need not be extraordinary. Just feed them. They need not leave declaring that there was some strange occurrence, that uh, gourmands and gourmets were satisfied beyond their imagination. Just feed them. Just make them full. And in the drunkenness of their fullness, they will declare strange things about you. You will become, you will become famous just because you fed them. Jesus declared about himself. There were people who followed Christ not because of who he was, not because of what he said, but because of the loaves and the fishes. There are people who will follow for food. And I discovered that when I would announce a youth congress, the first thing on the poster would be food. There'll be lunch. There'll be dinner. And then after that, I discovered that music drew people. I hate to burst the bubble of, of uh, these theologians who are budding, but the fact is that preaching does not draw them best. If you have food and music, you can bring an ordinary preacher. And the people will be happy if they know that there is music before the sermon and food after. They will listen to anything. But the people are still saying, John did no miracle, but all the things that he said were true. I, I am amazed at the consequence of this declaration. Had Jesus disagreed with it, there must have been some other text listed here. But there is no word from the Lord to say, ah, but you are wrong. Jesus hears them and does not disagree. Evidently, by his silence, he shows that he is consistent with them in this thought. That while he healed no one, there was no one going around saying, I was crippled, but John made me walk. I was blind, but John made me see. I came with some deformity, and John straightened my limbs. I came without being able to, to walk, or to see, or to hear, or to speak. John did none of this. But when you consider the power of his word, maybe the text should be understood to say, John did no miracle, but his words... But his words, the things that he declared were powerful. Powerful because they were true. 
Now, my question in an analytical sense is how could it be that one who comes according to Luke chapter 1 and verse 17 in the spirit and power of Elijah comes without doing miracles? If Elisha, who succeeded Elijah, could be successful in requesting and receiving a double portion of God's spirit, then how could the one who the scripture designates who will come in the spirit and power of the man who went up in the fiery chariot, how can it be that he performs no miracle? How can it be that, that when he represents him in a sense that is recognized by Jesus, Jesus in fact says in Matthew 11 and verse 14 that if you can bear it, this is Elijah. But how can it be that he comes representing Elijah doing no miracle? I want to suggest, I cannot use the original language, it's not there. But let me say that this text in my estimation points to the power of the spoken word when that word is spoken in truth. When you add to the scripture, it may sound better. But it is not more powerful. When you subtract from it, it may make people feel more comfortable, but it does not have more power. The truth unvarnished and unchanged is what has power. And this man who did no miracle spoke words in truth so that after his death he is still recognized. And the people who heard him, though they cannot say he healed me, can testify that the words changed me. For there is power in words to make a difference. If you will travel with me to the sanctuary that John the Baptist chose as his home church. I believe I've been there. Can you see these? well-heeled socialites having traveled from the city with all of its accoutrements they come now dressed like they would dress in the city but can you imagine that there is no beautiful place for them to alight as they listen to these words they have traveled out of the pristine elements that represent all that their culture has to offer they have put it down for the sake of the truth no miracle there is no offer that anything will happen that is extraordinary enough to make someone changed in physicality but the words draw them the words are magnetic enough to draw the socialites from the city out to this strange place where maybe they perched on a rock or a tree stump maybe they gathered up their fine garments about them or took them off and folded them up in some neat place for there was no place to hang them and to be pretty while they listened to this preaching but the word was so powerful that they came anyhow there is power in the word so this man preaches i i uh, believe the messenger to the church remnant i believe that there came one day Herod out to make an arrest. I gather from the account that Herodias, his paramour, had become bored with the declarations of this, this country preacher. Preacher who couldn't even dress right. No slave to fashion was John the Baptist. Did not wear what the priests wore. Did not even seek to mimic their garments. Instead wore camel's hair tied with leather. Did not choose to eat like they ate. But instead took wild honey and squeezed it. And simply put it into his mouth. And some would have it that he ate insects. I choose to believe what the prophet says. That these are the fruits of the carob plant. And he simply eats what's there. So that he owes nobody anything. If... If you owe your existence to some small party, you must always be careful not to offend them. But if your sustenance comes from nature, 
then you only owe allegiance to God. So evidently this preacher sleeps in the wilderness and eats wild honey and eats the carob plant and owes nothing to anybody, makes short forays into the city so that he can discern the evil thereof. But then withdraws himself to ruminate on it and turn it about in his mind and allow the Holy Spirit to shake the salt on it that makes preaching out of it. And then in his desert pulpit stands up to declare, now this woman had become disturbed and she says, go out and get him and arrest him. Herod made one strategic error. He allowed himself to listen to a sermon before he acted. He should have acted immediately. You see there is power in the word that will touch even those who would arrest the preacher. Oh, I love that kind of talk. <laughs> there are some people who don't understand that while the stories are not like they used to be in days of yore, the power of preaching is yet the same. Even in a world that's turned upside down, even in a society that has gone mad, preaching still holds sway. If you trust enough to declare enough truth, then God will still anoint it with Holy Ghost power. And it will still make a difference even in those who would do you harm. Comes Herod now with a mission. Perhaps he had those with him who had the power to arrest. And he says to them, let's just listen for a moment. Now any other preacher might have tried to cloak the sermon in symbolic language. But when you owe nothing, you can tell it just like it is. So somewhere in the sermon, John turns to the situation at the palace. Now you will forgive me, but I believe that an audience must react to that kind of preaching. For after all, somebody may want to say, does he know who's here? Has he seen Herod here? You know, it's okay to preach while he's not here, but has he, does he know? John knows, not only does he know, but he's chosen his subject matter based on the audience. He knows who's there. He begins to lay out in full detail how someone claiming to lead in God's stead can do something that is so heinous in the sight of God. And for a moment, the power of the preaching touched the heart of Herod. Bible says he heard him gladly. Now, I, I use sanctified imagination after this, and I confess it with intellectual honesty. <laughs> what happened when Herod got home? How did he explain to Herodias what he had intended to do? What, what words did he use to start this dialogue that would end with the declaration, we've got to stop doing this. The best way to start is to start with the summary sentence, but here again he hesitates. And maybe it went something like this. Uh, Herodias, uh, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you know the preacher. I, I went to arrest him and uh, did you do it? Well, well, wait, 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 just let me tell it. Don't rush me. Um, we were going to do it. But, 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 sweetheart, you ought to hear the man. There's something about him. I, I, was, I was fully intent on arresting him, but, but before long he was talking about me and you. And I sat there and I couldn't believe it. At first I was angry, but then something came over me. I, you would have had to be there. In fact, I, I wish you would come and, and go out there with me because you, you would understand what it is to, to, to sit and listen to the power of what this man says. And I've come home to tell you that, that, that we got to, we got to, we, we, <laughs> Herod, Herod, sit down. You, you're overwrought, honey. Let me just massage your muscles. You, you're so tense. I can feel the tension in your shoulders. 
Now just be quiet. Don't you don't have to go on with this foolishness that you're talking. Honey, the man lives in the woods. <laughs> He's liable to say wild things, dear. And before it's over, the prophet to the remnant church says that she has fastened him again in her devices. In fact, you must understand that when you speak truth, when you speak truth without miracles, Satan is so personally annoyed that he will custom tailor a problem for you. What he did was to look at at John the Baptist's lifestyle. You see, the thing that disturbs one does not bother another. But give Satan credit for being an astute student of human nature. He understands what it is that bothers people, what it is that causes them to be disturbed. He looks at a man who has lived outside for all of his recorded life. I'm sure there's there's more than what we read. But for all we know, as a youngster, this young man must have moved as soon as he found himself ready for ministry. He must have moved outside so that he was not encumbered by walls, by convention, even by conventional thinking. So he is not formed. He is not molded by those who are so timid that they cannot declare what is truth. Therefore, in, in this custom tailoring process, Satan evidently recognizes that if he loves the outdoors, there is nothing that will disturb him more than being incarcerated. If he loves to squeeze honey from the honeycomb, if he loves to eat what is out in nature, free for the taking, if he enjoys no walls and no ceiling, if his joy is to look up at night and see the stars twinkling overhead and clouds moving silently by, if that is his joy, then lock him in the bowels of some prison where all the only rhythm that he hears is the dripping of water from some strange condensation or the movement of strange little animals in the darkness. Put him there so that he cannot see the sunlight or feel it warm upon his face. Put him there where he will no longer look up and declare, I see God in the heavenly bodies. Put him there and make it so that he will always see what is unnatural about him. So Satan arranges it. This woman finally overcomes Herod. Herod causes the arrest of John. And John is placed in prison. I will come back and get him. But let me say to you. That the power of words. Will sometimes get you in trouble. So while you say now. And you do have the luxury now of saying. Theoretically. What you will do when you leave. Understand that when you go into the real world, that everything has consequences. The failure to declare truth has consequences. And I have determined that those consequences are the worst of all. I believe that I would rather be persecuted and cast out for saying what is right than to be ignored and to drift off the radar screen for not declaring anything. In fact, if I look at Job's experience and study it well, there is some blessing in being on the devil's radar screen. Evidently, not only on Satan's, but on God's. So that in that concourse, when they came together, God brags on him. Now, in that context, sometimes you might wish that God would not. But I believe I'd rather suffer Whatever consequences there are for doing what's right, 
than to be swept into the margin for doing nothing at all. I'd rather be in a blaze of glory and burn out in the name of Jesus than never to shed light on anything for all of my lifetime. But if you will tell the truth, you must understand the consequence of words. And, and this man understands words. Now you remember, there are two places where you could almost say that John reached his zenith with words. And these are terse declarations. At the baptism of Jesus, <laughs> the message of the Rimmer Church says that when John looked out on, on those crowds every day, the, the, the power of sin etched its picture on their faces. I paraphrase now. The fact is that whomever it is that you associate with will paint a picture on your face. I don't have time to preach that one. You'll have to take it yourself. But your countenance will tell on you. When John looked out over the congregation, he saw people coming to repent. But he could not ignore that Satan had marked them. But now comes a face with no negative mark. No wonder he observed him from afar off. No wonder he could pick him out of the crowd. Because while others had been marked by sin, came one now that was not marked in that fashion. In fact, the light of obedience was shining forth from him. And he declares, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And, and when I read it in Desire of Ages, my heart is lifted for in that exchange that comes after when Jesus is humble and John is humble, but they say, suffer it to be so. When this kinsman lifts up his hand, perhaps, to declare, and I've been down there to the place where they say that it happened. Not much water left there now, but it could be so. Wherever it was, when Jesus went down under the water and came out, there was light in the form of a dove, burnished bronze light in the form of a dove and the voice of God declaring this is my beloved son not everybody heard not everybody saw there is a meaning there for when God speaks and when the Holy Spirit appears not everybody is prepared to witness it or to hear it there are some who will be close by who will not hear and will not see but if your heart is open towards God you will John the Baptist heard the voice of God, saw the light in the form of a dove. And in that moment, I suggest to you that his words were at their highest. Or maybe it was when their disciples began to have some strange tension between them. It was bound to happen. You see, some of those who follow don't understand the whole plot they don't understand all the way from beginning to end they don't know the meaning of everything some of them were just there for the popularity popularity with john popularity with jesus now they come facing each other over matters of fasting and baptism and straining at gnats and swallowing camels and john now is faced with this question will you repudiate this jesus and in that moment, he had the opportunity to say words that would have impeded the power of the gospel. All he had to do, in fact, was to be quiet. Sometimes the easiest way to go is to say nothing when truth ought to be declared. But instead, he skirted the strange issues that divided them and simply said, I must decrease. And he must increase that's the bottom line of my ministry this man understood the power of words understood them Ellen White says that he understood them so well because while he did no miracle his words were so powerful that he he had the opportunity to simply declare his candidacy for king He would have needed no placards, no campaign war chest, no organizational structure. 
just words if he had said I am willing or if he had put his words in those strange ways that preachers talk you know how we are they're bringing up your name for some leadership position will you allow us to put your name in nomination well you know I don't seek anything <laughs> but if the brothers and sisters insist I am willing to allow the dagger of leadership to be plunged into my chest <laughs> All John had to do was to allow his candidacy to go forward. And priests and people would have declared him king. He knew the power of words. And all he had to do then was to draw power to himself. Satan, says the messenger, came to him with every temptation that a human being can receive in that particular situation everything that he could think of that was grand that was within his grasp all he had to do was close his hand on it but instead he withdrew in complete self abnegation and declared I am not here to seek for myself I have come to declare one whose shoes I am not capable I am not ready to take off his feet or put back on and so in the moment of his grandest temptation, when only words, no miracle, only words would have put him on the throne, he declined. This man knew the power of words. Now there is a dark moment in his experience. And I'm practically, I must tell you, I'm glad it's there. For if all of the people in the Bible were without flaw, you and I would be lost. If you could look at every life and see nothing, if the Bible would not record it, then what hope would we have? But look at a man who resists the throne. And now after his incarceration, remember, he was a man who loved freedom. And Satan had taken it. Now come his friends. And I don't want to spend too much time on friends. But maybe I ought to say just a word. There are people who claim to be your friends who will do your greatest harm. These friends, declares the spirit of prophecy, gave thoughts to John that he never would have come up with without them. Hmm? <laughs> I think I've been there too. John, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> we, we came to cheer you up. Um, Jesus, uh, he's uh, entertaining publicans and eating with them, and you know, it's not exactly what we thought you were describing when you first talked about him, but you know, I guess that's all right. Um, remember those crowds that used to follow you, John? Man, I remember the whole hillside used to be full of people. Well, now some of those same people are following. Jesus, but we just, we just came to cheer you up. <laughs> I remember you used to say he was going to be the Lion of Judah. He was going to come and set the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. I remember I used to try to visualize what he would look like when he came. This one who you declared that you weren't worthy to take his shoes off. And, and I must admit to you, John, I, he's, he's not... What, what, at least what I thought you were saying. But we just came to cheer you up. <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll be leaving now. <laughs> In the darkness of that prison cell. While some scholars say rodents scampered about him. In the mist of darkness. A doubt crept into his heart. I ask you a question. How can somebody who knows the power of words, he can't say that he doesn't know, because this man who did no miracle could have been king. 
He knows. So in the hours that went silently by, he must have thought through them carefully. Now he says to his disciples, go to Jesus and ask him this. Are you the one? Or should we look for another? That means that he had to divorce from his mind the bright light that shone down from heaven. He had to cross out of his memory the, the, the dove-like light. He had to chase from his mind the voice of God coming down over a beam of light. Sprint declares that they are able to send sound over a beam of light that goes through a plastic tube. And they would suggest that they are the first to create it. But I beg to differ. For it was God who drew back the curtain and allowed heavenly light to shine down to that baptismal font. And who spoke through that beam of light and let his voice be heard by John. And now John pushes it all to the corner of his mind. And calculates his words. And says, are you the one? Or do we look for another? I wish I could have been there when Jesus got the word. I don't know how clouded his face might have become, but the words hurt him. They were aimed to hurt. They were aimed to cause death. But Jesus would not be daunted by them. In fact, the very messengers, he let them just kind of sit there for a while. Because sometimes the answer is not in words, but in deeds. John had done no miracle, but Jesus would perform miracles. So now Jesus, who is the one who was foretold by John, allows the superiority of his ministry to evince itself. And while the witnesses sit there and watch, he brings someone crippled and makes them walk, brings someone blind and makes them see, brings someone deaf and lets them hear, brings someone mute and they speak. And when they have seen enough, he calls him and said, now, 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 go tell him what you saw. Go tell him what you saw. Now the words that were aimed to hurt are turned around. And they go now to witness to the power. And they serve to certify that John's ministry was not for naught. But it was the right one about whom he testified. Now, I, I close with this thought. For I admit to you that I have been troubled. I stood uh, some months ago in the place where they are fairly sure John was beheaded. There was no physical reaction that was not mentally ignited. I felt nothing there that I can report to you in a super normal fashion. But I thought again, what must it have been on that night when a man whose words had been so great that when the people heard him say, I'm going to bring you somebody whose shoes I'm not worthy to take off, when they thought there is nobody that great. Nobody can be that much greater than you are. But instead of grasping power, he let it go. How could it be that God would allow, that Christ would allow, for his kinsmen to be caught in the bowels of that palace when above him was a drunken social hour proceeding? When the king drank himself into mental oblivion and sat there with his cohorts who either were drunk with him or had given complete freedom to their senses. Can you imagine what it must have been like when this scheming woman brought her would-be daughter clothed in scanty garments? Ellen White says, in the full bloom of her womanhood. A young lady who had holy connections in her life. A young woman who never should have been dancing like that. But because of the scheming of this woman under the influence of Satan. And women must not ever take umbrage to this story. For it does not speak so much to the power of a woman as to the weakness of a man. 
how could a king allow it to be so? Even though she cannot be classified as the fruit of his loins, how could it be so that a man in that position to a young woman of her breeding would allow her to come and dance in that fashion? He should have had the moral fiber to stand up, but he had cast his nobility into a bottle, into a container, exchanging it there for liquor. Whatever container it was that brought this substance now contained his wisdom and the substance was now in his body. So he sits there and allows these salacious people under the influence of some controlled substance for that day to look with lascivious eyes at this young woman. And in the midst of this scene of debauchery, this woman calls the little girl to her and says, come, sweetheart. Did I just hear him say, what would you have? Go and tell him the head of John the Baptist. Where were the angels? Where was the power that had focused a nation on his personality? Where was the God who had strengthened him? To turn aside this temptation. Where was the Jesus who he had baptized? Where was his help? When that messenger went down underneath with that weapon. What transpired when the man came to John and said, I, I don't know how to tell you this, John. But I've got to take your life. Did John hope against hope? That some miraculous power would intervene? Or did he understand that his life which had been lived with no miracle would now come to an end with no apparent miracle? The prophet to the remnant church says this. Every martyr that will ever go to death in the name of Jesus will reflect on John the Baptist. Now, the Bible records it in one way. Ellen White records it in another. Let me update it. Every prisoner in every cell before the coming of Christ, everyone who must die before the time of Jacob's trouble, before the weapons melt and before the guns will not fire, before the electric chairs will not Find enough power before the pants will not drop in the gas chambers. Before the lines will not bring the poison in some strange chamber that brings poison into the body in that new way now. In every moment, you will reflect on the name of John. And I believe, and I go out now on a limb, but I take what the prophet says. There was ever an exchange with angels who brought to John the promises of God. You may die in the process, but God is able to bring people back from death. And what God can give back, he has the right to give away for the cause and the glory of his name. I do not believe that John the Baptist went away like some banished slave. I do not believe that he was some troubled victim, that he shivered and trembled before he died. I believe that he decided that it was for the glory of God. I believe that the same Jesus who distracted Stephen while the stones began to hit him could distract John so that he was there but not there. And I believe that John perished not as someone banished to a dark corner, but as one beckoned to a bright light. You will sleep, but you'll rise again. And I believe that it was his intent desire to please God. The prophet to the remnant church says that once we have come to know God well, we would not choose anything but what God chooses for us, for we recognize that whatever works for the glory of God is in our best interest in the long run. So if I live, let me live for the glory of God. And if I die, 
let me die for the glory of God. Or if I'm well, let me be well for the glory of God. If I'm sick, let me be sick for the glory of God. If I prosper, let me prosper in his name. If I am impoverished, I will suffer in his name. Whatever I will bring glory to his name. For I am willing to die with words and no miracle. If it will bring glory to his name. 